Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session will begin in two minutes. As Russia's war against Ukraine continues to manifest and cause severe harm, the global community remains dangerously divided. Europe, after a period of unprecedented solidarity, is at risk from splintering and collapsing from the weight of both internal and external problems. Against the backdrop of these challenges, Senior level stakeholders will converge in Bratislava to generate ideas and solutions on how to overcome what is defining the changing global order. Good afternoon. I'm Kim Dozier from CNN and the Military Times. Hello, and I'm Kevin Barron, the executive editor of Defense One. Welcome. Welcome to the 18th Forum here in Bratislava, where we've gathered with presidents and prime ministers and practitioners of national security and foreign policy to look primarily at Russia's continuing war on Ukraine and the cracks it's exposed in our security plans, in our supply chains, and the cracks it could create in some of our alliances. That's how we've come up with our theme, Overcoming Global Fragility. Overcoming Global Fragility. So what does that mean? Well, the conference has come up with three bullet points. Oh my gosh, there's so many people. Good luck finding a seat. Welcome. <laughs> three bullet points on overcoming global fragility. One, continuing support for Ukraine, of course. Two, strengthening resilience in Europe. And third, what, why are you here today? Global dialogue. So your job at this forum is to generate breakthrough ideas and solutions to overcome the challenges that shape the changing global order. Now, to take part in the dialogue here at the forum, um, we invite you to open up your GlobeSec app. If you haven't downloaded the GlobeSec app yet, uh, it's important that you do because it's the only way you're going to see the agenda. There is no printed agenda this time. Um, you can also network with other attendees, um, and you can answer polls to take part in the dialogue happening in front of you on stage. That's right. So to start, if you look over my shoulder, there's your QR code to join Slido. And our first question, we're going to have a practice round here, right? So to set it up, the war is changing the nature of alliances. Non-alignment partnerships are fueling global fragility. So here's your question. With growing uncertainty, 
Are democracies prepared to adapt their policy objectives in an increasingly multipolar polar world defined by more selfishness? Now, we asked this question on Twitter earlier this week and got interesting results. About 48% said yes, 46% said no, pretty even. 6% were other. So what do you all think? 53, 47, 50, come on, no's, you're getting, uh, yes. All right, well, sounds like we gotta figure this question out. Yeah, we're gonna have to keep <laughs> asking that question and see if this is a, a, a positive or a negative audience. So um, on some housekeeping points, the forum will be happening on three stages here in the Danube Theater, also inside the venue um, in the Maria Teresia Theater in the Round, and on the Globesec boat, where you'll have closer, more intimate conversations about some of the problems we're trying to solve. There'll actually be something like 40 different side events, some of which are invite only, where you can sit across the table with other practitioners and discuss problems. Um, and if some of the events require translation, you'll find translation on uh, kits on your chairs. If you don't see a translation kit and need one, uh, look for one of the organizers to get you one. Uh, in addition to those events, if you don't have an invitation, that's okay. This evening there's a cocktail reception and you're all invited. So everyone is welcome to that. Tomorrow evening, though, you do need an invitation for the awards reception at the Bratislava Castle, and there are buses that will depart from here or from your hotels to bring you there and back, either, either way. And throughout the event, also, there are coffees and lunches. You'll find those at the main hotel on the ground floor and the first floor, as you like. So with that, we'll be waiting our first guest shortly, I think. Yes, we're queuing on, ladies and gentlemen, Her Excellency Zuzana Chapatova, the President of Slovak Republic, joining us. Madam President, thank you. And now I would like to introduce Globesec founder and president, Robert Vosch. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Madam President, distinguished guests, uh, dear friends, it's so great to see you uh, in Bratislava, so many familiar faces and so many friends and so many new faces that I see here for the first time. But firstly, I'm really glad that I'm able to open the 18th edition of the Globsec Forum here in Bratislava. Let me take a little moment to acknowledge the sheer diversity in this room because uh, there is an impressive representation here in Bratislava, uh, 1,300 guests from 63 countries, including several world leaders, foreign and defense ministers, experts, business leaders, and distinguished journalists. Your presence here underscores the gravity of the situation and recognition that together uh, we can make the difference. But as much as I'm delighted about the fact that so many people came, we have a lot of work to do together. Because we are gathering here at a very critical juncture in history. The Russian war in Ukraine has made this forum a gathering on the front lines of democracy and freedom. And as President Biden has put it, we are living in an inflection point. Either democracy, freedom, and the liberal world order will prevail, or lawlessness will take its place. So that the global future is now being decided here in Central Europe, or let me put it differently, the future of the West is now being decided in Central Europe or in Eastern Europe. Looking back at the first year of the war, we have seen a testament to Ukraine's unwavering determination and ability to stand strong in the face of Russian aggression. Ukrainian people have demonstrated remarkable courage, resilience, and sacrifice. They have paid the highest price for peace, and their steadfastness serves as an inspiration to all of us. But also the invasion of Ukraine has also galvanized an unprecedented unity of the West. Bold decisions of NATO and EU have surpassed all the expectations we had at this conference last year. 
We have broken the long-standing taboos. We have shipped weapons to Ukraine to defend itself. Uh, we have granted candidacy status in the meantime to Ukraine, to the European Union. We have shared intelligence and many others. So the international community has sent a powerful message that acts of aggression will not go unchallenged and that the international community stands united in the defense of principles that underpin the global order. But our work is far from over. The war that is going on in Ukraine is not isolated just to Ukraine. It has multiple front lines. The second front line is inside of our societies, in Europe, in information space, because we are grappling with the proliferation of disinformations that seeks to divide us, distort reality, undermine our democratic institutions, decrease our political ability to act and to defend ourselves. And here in Central Europe, and particularly, my country finds itself on the front line of this war as well. The third and fourth front line of the same war that Russia waged against us is the energy war and the economic war. We are seeing the consequences on our everyday life, inflation, uh, higher energy prices. And we have to acknowledge that this is a consequence of the war that Vladimir Putin has started, not a consequence of our choices that we have made. The sooner we acknowledge this, the, the, the faster we will be able to win on all the fronts, because to win in Ukraine, we have to win at home as well to gain the political momentum. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, during these upcoming days, we will talk about the war that is taking place at this very moment. I'm very happy that we have um, uh, Olga Stefanishina here with us, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine. Uh, and I wish you a lot of success in the upcoming very difficult days. But we will be talking about the consequences of war, about holding Vladimir Putin to account for these terrible crimes he has committed. We will talk about reconstruction of Ukraine, about its uh, path to EU and NATO. And yes, yes, we will talk about peace. But let us be clear, there cannot be peace without justice. There cannot be peace on Vladimir Putin's terms. We all want peace. We pray for it. We wish it. Nobody wants peace more than Ukrainians. But we want a peace that restores territorial integrity of Ukraine and a peace that is lasting and a peace that is just. And as we embark on this collective endeavor uh, for a more secure world, I'm reminded of an African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And we need the cooperation of the international community uh, to go far. And I'm happy that Globsec here in Bratislava can bring together so many important leaders from 63 countries, because the discussions about the future, about the peace, are so important. And this is our contribution, our small contribution, of a country in the center of Europe to the global security. So let us remember these uh, wise words. Uh, but let me thank to all of the partners without whom this would be impossible to organize. You have seen them on the corridors, all the private partners, all the, the governments. I would like to especially uh, thank to the government of Slovakia, especially Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. But also this year, a special thanks goes to the Czech government and the Austrian government, represented by their foreign ministers, who have helped uh, tremendously to create a forum that is truly center European. It's based in Bratislava, but is contributed by, by the uh, countries that surrounding uh, Slovakia to make this a success, and I want to thank you uh, for that. So standing here today and looking at this very distinguished uh, uh, and impressive crowd, I'm confident that uh, we will have excellent and fruitful discussions and excellent uh, three days. So I wish you fruitful discussions and thank you for coming. And I would like to welcome on stage Madam President of Slovakia, uh, Zuzana Čaputová, who is here already for the third or fourth time. She is uh, 
a supporter of Globsec and she is a supporter of international cooperation. Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for the excellent cooperation. Madam President, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm glad to see you again here in Bratislava. Conference like this, it's a great opportunity for discussion very important topics or issues that we are facing today and for making good decisions for the future. I would like to thank Globsec for organizing this event. The title of last year's Globsec was Survive and Prosper. No wonder. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine was in its third month. Many people feared that Ukrainians' courage won't be matched by our collective military support. Energy prices across Europe were rising. We all remember the fears of high inflation and gas storages over winter. After one year, we have more than survived. Gas levels in European storages are in historic highs and inflation is slowly going down. To our east, Ukraine is fighting back and Russia controls less territory in Ukraine than a year ago. We should draw a clear lesson from all of this. We are far more resilient than we expected. And we are stronger than our opponents. We are capable of both addressing our internal challenges and helping to our partners, such as Ukraine. Of course, we are still facing many internal and ex external risks. But my point is simple. To prevail, we need to stay the course, continue what we are doing and do it better. And to succeed, we mustn't fear as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. There are concrete reasons why we are in the better position today than a year ago. The first one is our unity. Our united and collective action and our joint gas purchases helped us through the winter. Our unity on sanctions has had a real effect on Russia's economy. And Moscow has fewer resources to produce or buy sophisticated weapons. Of course, our unity is already tested but those, uh, by those who say that our measures aren't working or that we must only focus on narrow national interests. The developments of the past two years already prove that these critics are wrong. Secondly, it was our solidarity which improved our position. Solidarity amongst the EU and NATO and with our partners. In response to Russia's full-scale invasion on Ukraine, NATO allies increased their presence on the eastern flank. And we will continue to do so also through the decisions we take at the NATO summit in Vilnius next month. To reassure our citizens and to send a clear message to our opponents that every inch of NATO territory is and will be defended. We already welcomed Finland as a NATO member and of course expect Sweden to join very soon. Our solidarity with our partners, partners has benefits for our own security. By helping the Ukrainians, we are helping to keep Russian aggressor further away from our borders. But let's remember that Ukraine is doing so at an enormous cost. No one would imagine that Europe in the 21st century would have places such as the Ukrainian village of Yahidna. I was there a month ago and I uh, spoke with uh, survivors of the 26 days of terror. 
367 people, including children and the elderly, were held in local schools underground in horrible conditions. The Russian army set up a command center about them. Yes, the civilians were used as a human shield. 11 of them died. We don't know how many more Yahidnes are on the occupied territories, but it's our, our, uh, it's our duty under the UN Charter to help ensure that none remains and that those who committed such crimes are held accountable. Finally, we must match our unity and solidarity with long-term resolve and determination because our opponents hope that with enough time and a huge dose of disinformation, public opinion in our countries will shift and governments will change the course. Yes, this is where we are at disadvantage. Extremists are using uh, democratic rights against democracy itself. For example, freedom of speech, very important democratic right, is abused for spreading disinformation and hate speech. We must better protect our democracy, including through balanced regulation and not be naive about what is happening. We should enforce the already existing national legislation. At the EU level, evaluate the effectiveness of our regulation and be ready to strengthen it if needed. At the global level, we should increase the accountability of the owners of social media platforms for the content that is posted. Ladies and gentlemen, the events since the Russian aggression show that time and history are on the side of democracy. Let's make sure that we can not only build a zone of democracy and freedom in, in Europe, but also we can keep it. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a very good and fruitful discussion. Thank you. Madam President, thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you're invited to stay in your seats as we begin our first session with our first presenter, Akash Madera from the BBC. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for being here with me today. My name is Kasia Madeira. I'm a journalist and I am thrilled to be here with you. I am of Polish origin and I have to say this is my first time in Slovakia. It is beautiful. I am very thrilled to be in beautiful Bratislava. Thank you so much for the welcome, Madam President. Thank you. So today, this is going to be a dynamic session. We are putting America on the spotlight. We're really going to hone in and see if this really is the indispensable leader of the 21st century. Now, we all know that the second half of the 20th century, we were where America led. Most of the world followed. But is that the case now, now that we are in a very changing dynamic? Of course, once again, we see war in Europe and we're seeing a changing climate in terms of power dynamics with China and Asia. So is the United States the indispensable leader of the 21st century. To answer that question, we are going to put to the test my esteemed guest. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome.